Perfect. Hello, hello everyone. Buenos dias um, uh, to our uh, fifth regional workshop um, hosted and conducted by our colleagues from CISIC. Um, so just some words about um, ORIS2 to give you a, a, a little bit of an overview who we are, what we are doing. Um, some of you might heard about us already, our Horizon 2020 project. So we are supported through the European Commission, um, ORIS2, Auctions for Renewable Energy Support, um, where we are actually dealing a lot with renewable energy auctions. So our project started in November 2018 and is um, going until October 2021 and is coordinated by Fraunhofer ISI in Germany. Um, and basically our um, consortium consists of 11 institutions from six EU member states plus the UK. Um, and as you can see, we are um, we have a lot. Um, we are from uh, different um, backgrounds. We have universities, universities. We have research institutions. We have consultancies. So um, very interdisciplinary approach when we are looking into um, renewable energy auctions. So what are our um, three core objectives in general? Um, we want to generate and communicate new insights on the applicability, performance, and effects of specific auction designs. We want to provide tailor-made policy support for different types of auction applications. And furthermore, we want to facilitate knowledge exchange between stakeholders. And this is exactly what we are doing today. But I didn't want to skip. Yeah. Um, so we want to facilitate the knowledge exchange between stakeholders. This is one of our core objectives. Um, therefore, we are conducting this kind of workshops where we want to bring people together. And in this case, we want to learn today more about the um, new Spanish uh, um, and a re renewable energy support scheme, the new auction scheme, and furthermore, present to you our results, our latest results from the um, ORIS project, and discuss it with you and see what you think about it and get your questions and your feedback. Um, what what, uh, what uh, have we done um, so far? We have um, more than 12 country case studies on different auction schemes um, all over Europe and um, worldwide. We have the ORIS2 auction database. We are producing um, policy briefs where we are looking at really um, urgent and current topics um, from our point of view. We are producing um, reports in general. Um, for example, we're looking into financing um, conditions for renewables. We are looking into renewables um, and energy communities. And um, we are looking in more uh, in depth um, into these topics uh, by producing several research papers. Furthermore, we have several workshops where we look at really either in depth into um, different topics or we are presenting and discussing with you our overall results. And last but not least, we are quite proud to um, work together with several ministries, for example, in Austria, Denmark, Germany and Hungary, where we are discussing their um, auction approaches with them. So before um, I give the word to Pablo, I want to make a little bit of um, advertisement. So please, um, if you're interested in our results in our project, um, subscribe to our newsletter, visit our website, get in contact with, with us, tell us please what you think about our project and, and or um, what we should look into uh, more uh, into detail. So um, thank you very much from my side. Uh, by the way, I'm Vasilis Anatolitis. I think I'm here uh, as go to webinar, so it's not very intuitive who I am and yeah no thank you very much um, we'll, um, we'll you'll see me later on but first um, Pablo thank you very much again for hosting this okay well can you hear me well okay great um, well good morning everybody I'm Pablo del Rio from the Consejo Superior de Investigaciones Científicas the National Research Council of Spain um, I'm really uh, very happy to welcome you to this fifth uh, regional workshop of the RS2 project. It's really, I'm really happy for this. We have uh, two fascinating hours ahead of us uh, with eight presenters, uh, which will give insights on different aspects of auctions and particularly on how they have affected and are affecting the renewable energy sector, as well as other perspectives from the uh, RS2 partners, from the RS2 consortium partners. So, first of all, thanks a lot. Uh, to all the presenters, also to the audience for being there, uh, particularly the presenters who made an effort to, and will uh, also make an effort during this, uh, during this during these presentations. 
Um, so we have, uh, as I said, about two hours. Uh, I mean, uh, every presenter will have about 10 minutes uh, followed by questions. Um, you can actually, um, well, uh, yeah, oh, okay. This is a learning by doing, I guess, uh, exercise hmm. as well for me. So, um, I mean, the workshop will be recorded and published, um, but without the questions and answer sessions. Um, so if you have any questions, I would suggest that you preferably type your questions in the question box so that I collect them and uh, then I uh, make them to, the, uh, to each presenter after each presentation. Uh, in case, uh, I mean, you can always raise your hand uh, uh, I mean, the, uh, online, of course, uh, in the software, but uh, it would be much better if you type your questions in the question box. So uh, I think I, I don't forget anything. Um, well, uh, I look forward to, to hear from the presenters and it, I think it will be really, really a very nice experience, I hope. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll start with the... Uh, um, with the first presenter, the first presentation by um, yeah, Hugo Lucas uh, from the Ministry of the Ecological Transition, Demographic and Demographic Challenge. Thanks, Hugo, for being here. I know you are quite busy, and this is really a luxury for you, uh, for us to, to have you here. So thanks a lot, and please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pablo, for the kind presentation. Good morning to everybody. First of all, of course, uh, uh, also thanks Pablo for the invitation to present uh, here today and to congratulate I Aures for the great work they've been doing for years. It's a, a work that I know very, very closely. Um, for me, it's really an honor uh, to always the possibility to support, uh, to support this project. So I'm going to present something that most probably, that uh, hopefully uh, will be approved in 10 days by the Council of Ministers. It's the new regime uh, for renewable energies and in concrete uh, the framework, the economic framework uh, linked to auctions. Okay. Um, I do. Uh, uh, I think uh, I'm doing my best to. Uh, can, can you click on the presentation? I'm trying. I'm doing. Maybe. Uh, yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Right. So this was me, uh, but, but I don't know why I went back. Maybe because. Yeah. Okay. Try click. Try to click again. I did. So I'm waiting in case it's uh, very slow, and then I'm doing again backwards something or something. Because when you want, when you click once, you can actually move it with your keyboard. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Uh, mm -mm. Or Christoph, have you um, have you given um, Google the um, the control? I, I did nothing, so someone is doing that for me. But I'm okay. fine. I can say maybe, next please. Maybe it's okay, Christoph, if you just do it. Okay. Then next, please. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and next, because this one is uh, with several with several yeah more. Continue, please. And once more, I think. Yeah. So basically, uh, the main need uh, at present for a new scheme, uh, financial scheme for renewable energy, is one of the main reasons is the fact that we have a very ambitious uh, renewable energy uh, national integrated energy and climate plant. We are expecting to deploy 22 gigawatts in in new gigawatts in 10 years. Um, and of a new renewable energy project so we are we have to do this very quickly massively but very orderly and we want to benefit for the fact that today uh, renewable energy is the cheapest uh, new uh, power in spain we can go to the next one and we can go into the detail more on the reasons why yeah so very ambitious uh, target renewables is the cheapest and we want everybody to benefit in their uh, 
uh, bill of this uh, very cheap new, elect new electricity. Um, also because all project developers, as we know, they need some uh, certainty of in their incomes when they want to get finance uh, from the financial sector. So this will give uh, uh, certainty uh, to the investors in the future, in the future, in the future incomes. Now we can go to the next one. There is a couple of more, two more reasons: facilitate financial aid, cost saving for everybody. Uh, one thing that is becoming uh, very urgent and very important, and we will uh, come back to this topic, is also the urgency due to the economic crisis because of the sanitary crisis. So one of the main pillars for the national recovery, transformation, and resilience plans is the. Um, um, deployment of renewable energies and energy efficiency. Um, also, uh, this uh, auction framework will come with an, a schedule of calls and this will give planning so visibility to project developers. And finally, of course, we have to transpose the, the European Directive for Renewable Energies. Next one, please. Um, yeah, it. Uh, uh, the, the new scheme is for new uh, new installations or for new projects, new renewable energy projects. But nevertheless, uh, repowering uh, will be considered as well, or it's considered as well. And one important thing that is uh, uh, is hybridization. So maybe uh, existing wind farms will be able to deploy in the same site uh, PV uh, installations. Uh, to have one single hybrid uh, project, and this PV uh, will be able to be in the in the auctions, and also new hybrid uh, systems. Um, of course, it's a competitive system. Um, and basically, uh, uh, people will have to guarantee a minimum of energy, and uh, it will it will be pay as bid. And one thing that I will come back in detail to it is also that we are trying to. Uh, integrate the result of the auction in uh, each uh, megawatt air sold in the wholesale market so that this price will be a, a weight average price for everybody so everybody can benefit for the reduction of the cost of renewables but uh, there is a couple of slides discussing this uh, later on so next please <clears throat> one what i wanted to the message in this slide is that uh, we can discuss a lot about auction design, but at the end, there is a political factor, no? Uh, and, and I think for this particular scheme, it was key the political factor. I already discussed on the on the recovery plan and the and, and one of the main pillars being the renewables. But if you take the Spanish legislation, we see that already from 2013 there is a law saying that you cannot do pay as bid; you have to do marginalist, no? So our main challenge uh, for trying to get best practices on auction design into Spain, it was to change the law. And to change the law take you from 18 to 24 months. Uh, uh, second piece of legislation is a decree. Of course, since we are a monarchy, this is a royal decree. The decree uh, is discussed in the Council of Ministers and does not go, that don't have to go through the, through, through the parliament. So at the end, what we use is uh, something in the middle, a decree law, uh, that you can use only if it's uh, very well justified and urgent. Uh, so it's in an, an emergency and an urgency. Uh, and of course, uh, there is a lot of political discussions around it. It doesn't go through the parliament, but afterwards can be has to be ratified in the parliament. So uh, only to say that uh, it's a, a lot of political issues also around something that we are discussing very technically here or auction design, but at the end, most probably you could not get it. I mean, we just passed uh, one of the decrees that it was there for five years, you know, since 2015 on Generation on Island. So my point is, okay, we can discuss on ocean design, but at the end, if there is not some kind of political willingness or political good luck, <laughs> then uh, I mean, will not will, will not will not fly. Next, please. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, next, uh, there is, I think, two more, more, one more. Yeah, one more. And basically, uh, what it was the most difficult, as I say, it was the 23rd of June to pass a decree law saying we have to do auctions and we have to do it pay as bid. It was the most difficult, it's two lines, but by far the most difficult. And what I'm presenting now is the decree, the, the royal decree, which is the basics 
the basics of the future calls of the auctions. And the calls of the auctions, uh, the minister, uh, the minister is an ministerial order that is set by the minister solely discussing in the cabinet. Of course, in this royal decree, since it's the framework for the auctions, many things in the design are still open. We don't decide now. We will decide each year on each call. Okay. So next, please. Yeah. So for instance, on the product, okay, it's fully open. It can be energy, it can be capacity or a combination of both. Uh, the reason why is also because uh, we are thinking that it can be technologically specific or a group of technologies or technologically neutral, depending on the moment and depending what you need. So, of course, uh, 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 we will demand also to be flexible on the on the product action. Um, I will come back more on the energy, but basically uh, what we demand in the contract is a compromise of an amount of energy that has to be delivered with two conditions, a minimum per year and a maximum of years. But I will come back the, to this uh, later on. Uh, the bits is uh, euros per megawatt air, um, and then you will get pay as bid. And then, as I say, uh, you will have to participate in the in the market. So you will you will get your 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 bid price, but nevertheless, the day before you have to forecast, and of course you have to adjust your production. If not, you will get some penalties. So, so you have to be very active uh, 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 participating in the market. As this is now, so it's nothing new. Oh, I lost. Uh, uh, I lost. Uh, Sorry, one second. Uh, you see the presentation? We'll be, no, we will be okay. right back. I, there is something I, <laughs> I already broke the system. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I will not be surprised. <laughs> Christoph, can you still share it? Otherwise, I will do it. You were on the... Christoph? Okay, Christoph is done. Okay, sorry for that. But one second, Hugo. And we practice it quite a lot, you know, <laughs> that everything works <laughs> perfectly <Cool>. fine. <laughs> but as you know, always, can you see it again? Yeah, yes. I can see it. I can see it. Ah, oh, I can see it. And perfect. So basically, one missing thing that I was going to say, but it will come back so later on, is that we will have a ceiling price and maybe a minimum risk price. No, uh, that uh, uh, minimum price that below them we will not affect uh, bids. So next, please. Okay, and. It is implemented by the operator of the electricity markets, uh, as I say. Uh, projects they will have to deliver a minimum amount of energy every year, so there uh, will be penalties if you don't do it. It will be supervised by the regulator. Uh, it will be monitored implementation by two parties, of course, the the, the transmission network operator, Red Electric Española, will will measure the the physical quantities and will be matched with the quantities uh, sold to the operator of the market. And what I was saying uh, before, also the design is still pretty much open to depend on the call, and we would like to also have uh, the possibility to add other criteria besides price. Uh, so also to have, like I say, uh, call only for dispatchable technologies or call with a given criteria. For us, it's very important the just transition strategy and the just transition. Um, uh, locations where coal thermal power plants are being closed that maybe they don't have the best renewable energy resources but we want to deploy their renewable energy because of socioeconomical impacts so this is also kept uh, as a possibility uh, as a possibility in the in the decree in this please and also and also we also kept open the possibility to do some special 
a design option for renewable energy communities. Next, please. It's still the old one, or what does my God? What yeah. is? So now you should see it. Perfect. Mm. No, it's the same thing. It's the no, same it's one. The same. It's the same. Yeah. Oh my God! What is going on? Oh, oh. never again. Oh. <laughs> is it still the same thing or yeah I, I there's, there's no presentation on the screen uh, Vasily. there is no presentation in the screen wonderful no. now no no not yet ah okay wait a second oh my god I don't know what's going on today, really. Sorry, guys. <laughs> and it's not uh, Friday the 13th, so we cannot blame it on the <laughs> <for that. laughs> really And we have a uh, very patient audience. We are not losing audience. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they're really interested. They're expecting. <laughs> You're doing a good job, Hugo. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, they have everything. They have options and the show here. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! One second. It's horrible. This is like a series, not a not a not a movie, right? Oh. So let me try again. Still, it, you can still see no screen, I guess. No. No. Yeah. No, we can't. Pablo, do you have the slides? <laughs> I have the so, slides, yes. Can you try to share your screen? Because with me, it's not working. With Christopher, it's not working. Something is. Um, I'll make you presenter. So, Vasily, I'm so, back. Sorry for that. My ah, computer you, froze, oh, I great. think. You say that. Um, I can try to share again, but. Uh, yeah, yes. I'll make you yeah. presenter. Oh my God, it's really. Something is okay. Oh, okay. wonderful! So, which slide were you stopped? Did you stop? Um, uh, with Hugo, uh, so with Hugo. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, but just go ahead and I let me. I think it's uh, 17. I think it's uh, slide 17. I think. Okay, okay, this so, one. Thank you very much. Yeah, and thanks I, for your patience. I think this is the this is what I wanted to say now. Okay, uh, so yeah, one more for the little design on the bottom. One more click, so it comes the design. But basically, this is what I was trying to explain before: is there will be a minimum amount of hours every 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 365 days. Of course, it's not every natural year because if not, you can get a problem in in at the end of the year. So from the date of starting of operation and 365 days, then they will uh, the projects will have to deliver a minimum amount. Uh, can you click once more to see the design on the bottom? Uh, perfect. They will have to uh, sell this minimum amount. F for instance, let's put 300 hours in the case of, uh, of wind, and then they can send this minimum amount for a maximum amount of years. As an example, put 10. Then, they will have to sell 30,000 hours. If they decide to sell more under the auction contract, more than 3,000, let's put 3,500. So, of course, after eight and a half years, they are out of the contract. And there will be also a maximum amount of energy in which you cannot count it under the auction contract and you will have to go to the market. So, either you pass the maximum number of years or either you pass the maximum amount of hours every year. From there, you have to sell your electricity into, into the market. Next one, please. As I say, it will be a ceiling price. We also reserve ourselves the possibility to, to put a, a minimum uh, risk price so people don't be too low. And also to 
uh, be sure that we have competition. We also reserve our set the possibility to establish a percentage of uh, uh, the relation uh, the relation between the number of bids and the capacity auctions. So you will have always a minimum of competition. And also we reserve our set the possibility to uh, establish a maximum amount of capacity that one bidder can win in the auction. Next one, please. Yeah, um, it was one of, I mean, <laughs> one of the greatest challenge also in policy making is the European Commission. <laughs> And Digicomp uh, in particular, no, and uh, of course uh, we have to live with that. And it's always the discussion of the exposure in, uh, in the market, no, and competition. So uh, I think we reach a, a very a very high balance of uh, exposure of the markets of these uh, projects because, as I said before, they have to participate in the market. Even if they have a secure price, of course, the rest of the rules they, they apply for them. Uh, and also because they can reserve some of the energy to play in the different markets that you have in the during the day, you no. Know? And and as I say, last but not least, the amount of energy that is under the auction contract is uh, limited, and once it's overpassed, then they have to go uh, into the market. You no. Know? Next, please. And. The last uh, factor uh, for for the projects to be to have more exposure into the uh, into the market is something that is a new design option, or at least I have not seen it anywhere else. And it's a market exposure factor that I will try to explain. And this is mainly mainly for dispatchable technologies, uh, for these technologies to produce energy when it's more needed or when it's more expensive. So what we say is on top of the uh, uh, bid price, uh, the one you want, on top of that, we are going to give you a percentage of the difference between that price and the market price. So uh, I don't know, for instance, if you sold, if you sold uh, or you want, you want the bid at 30 euros, and your electricity is in the market when the price of the market is 50, and we, we can say that we will give you 10% of the difference, and at the end you get 32. So you get the 30 from the bid and the 10% of the difference between the market price of your bid. So 10% uh, uh, of this 20. So once again, this is to um, encourage, encourage uh, particularly dispatchable technologies to participate in the market when the prices are higher. Um, Next, please. And this is something that I advanced before. We want everybody to benefit of the low prices of renewable energies, and the result of the auctions it will be uh, reflected in the hourly electricity price, uh, and the hourly electricity price electricity price will be a weight average between the electricity sold under auctions and the electricity sold on the market. So, for instance. If you, if you have sold 50 um, gigawatts, uh, gigawatt air in this case, uh, in the market at 50, and the auctions are at uh, 30, so everybody will pay 40. Uh, so once again, it will be integrated in the final price of the electricity for everybody. Next, please. Mm -hmm. And then the last slide is on administrative procedures, because of course we also went here through all the discussion on what to demand to the project, how you can assure that these projects are serious projects, and how you can assure that uh, at the end uh, efficiency, you know, that those projects are going to be uh, const uh, constructed at the end. It was a lot of discussion if you have to demand some administrative procedures or. Uh, secure the development or some stage of development of the project, or if you should demand something to the project developer in terms of experience or <coughs> or, or financial capacity. But at the end, we have uh, decided to go uh, for financial guarantees. So we will not ask for any uh, for uh, 
um, any advance in the project, but of course we will give a very strict deadlines with guarantees. If you win, you have a, a few days to put your guarantees and to give all the details of your projects. And if you don't uh, meet this deadline, then of course we execute the guarantee. And then once this is passed, then you have few months uh, to construct your project. If it, this is not done, then I execute the guarantee. So finally, we have gone for a slight, uh, for very light uh, <clears throat> requirements for project or project developers, or, or no requirement for project or project develop, uh, developers, but for uh, very strong financial guarantees. And this is all I wanted uh, uh, to say today. And unfortunately, I cannot stay now, but I hope to uh, come back at 11 or a little bit after 11 uh, to follow to follow your webinar. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, okay, thanks, Hugo. Well, we, we have more, one question, but uh, since you are leaving, we can make it make it afterwards, probably. Okay, uh, please we come back. Okay, we come back. Ciao. <laughs> okay. Ciao, ciao. Thanks a lot. Okay. Well, we are a little bit in a, in a hurry now, so uh, we go uh, to the next presenter, um, Lucia Dolera uh, from the Spanish uh, Asociación de Empresas de Energía Renovables, Spanish uh, Renewable Energy Company Association. Uh, so uh, thanks a lot, uh, Lucia. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pablo. Good morning to everyone. Thank you for inviting APA Renewables to this interesting um, webinar. I think with the explanation of Hugo Lucas, part of my uh, presentation is going to be faster. Um, I really appreciate your invitation. I know the hard work and I'm aware of the uh, all the work that has to be done in a Horizon 2020 uh, project because uh, I've been the coordinator of one of them, I distributed PV, and now I'm currently uh, the coordinator of another uh, Horizon 2020 project, uh, Dress to Market, which can be a, a kind of a second part of the first one. And uh, I am aware that uh, a lot of work uh, has to be done here. Yeah. So, congratulations. Thank you for inviting me. Let's see if I have a better luck. Yes. Uh, let's cross the, the fingers. Well, as uh, you have said, um, uh, I'm working for APA Renewables, that is a, um, well, the Spanish Renewable Energy Companies Association. Uh, it is a business uh, association. Uh, it was born in 1987. Uh, so we are uh, defining the interest of our uh, companies for more than 33 years. And we are uh, very active uh, above all in Spain and also in Europe. And one of the strengths and um, advantages that we have is that we gather all the renewable technologies in, in the association. So uh, moving forward, I don't want to waste. We are uh, almost 400 associated companies and you see there the, the logo. So uh, with all the different uh, technologies uh, we have um, uh, from the, all the chain, industrial chain, we, we have uh, in all the associated uh, companies. Okay, so the first uh, slide I want to show you this um, a picture. I want to show you the picture of the power installed in the renewables energy in Spain. Uh, here um, I can highlight three main scenarios uh, uh, from two, 2005 to 2030, more or less. The first scenario, um, uh, well, uh, this is the renewable energy power uh, installed with, uh, let me say, um, a not such a competitive technology as we have now, uh, more expensive, and with uh, a, a support of feeding tariff. Uh, afterwards, we were in a kind of a uh, desert path where um, we have not really a, a government support. It, it was set a moratoria and we had those um, four or uh, five years uh, without uh, um, almost doing anything in, in renewables. But in 2016 and 2017, three calls for actions were uh, taken place. 
uh, mainly in order to reach the uh, objectives of 20 of the European 20 uh, objectives for Spain, 20% uh, of, uh, of renewables in, in, in the sector, uh, decrease 20% of CO2, 20% efficiency, etc. So uh, these uh, were the the movements of the government in order to reach that uh, objectives that, that Spain had for 2020. So um, uh, you can see there the second, the third part that in 2019, uh, 7GR awards were uh, installed in, in Spain due to that auctions that uh, took place uh, the previous years. Moving forward, the next one. Okay, so this is the, the structure. I, I'm don't, don't be scared. This is the the structure for the uh, 2017 Spanish auction. That uh, it, it was quite complex. Uh, the offers uh, mainly the offers were made with a reduction percentage over the initial investment investment cost. Uh, that at the end it was translating in a payment uh, by the installed power, but with a uh, not very easy way. So um, in the rest of the uh, world, uh, the auctions were almost done with a um, cost of the energy. And, and here now when you started with a power and then a percentage reduction, totally a, a, a very complex uh, uh, test. So mainly, uh, I, I will say that the objective is reaching the objective for Spain for 2020. It was action at power, not production. There weren't technology objectives, no, no technological neutrality, because for example, in 2016, um, the costs were only for wind and biomass. And the uh, two calls for 2017, uh, it was like uh, neutral, but uh, in a case of, of reaching a tie, uh, the technology with a more equivalent hours uh, were the ones that were uh, succeed. So uh, in this case, for example, uh, between wind and, um, by, uh, and, and, and PV, of course, uh, wind has more um, uh, equivalent hours per year, so uh, it was the, the winner. Uh, and all offers were at the maximum discount plan and a floor was warranted. Let's see, uh, here um, I'm going to show you the results of the, of the auctions. Um, in, in, in the amount of capacity that I was, it was given. For 2016, uh, we got uh, 500 megawatts, for my biomass, 2,000 megawatts. And then uh, the first auction in 2017, uh, wind power got uh, almost uh, three gigawatts. And solar PV, this is a coma, but in, in Spain, which is one megawatt. Okay, so in the first uh, auction, only one megawatt was um, granted for, for PV and three for, for a win. So unexpectedly, unexpectedly um, the government uh, opened another um, auction in, in July and uh, in the, well, uh, here are the results. Uh, for wind, uh, were um, one uh, one gigawatt. No, no, uh, one thousand. Sorry, one thousand uh, one hundred twenty-eight uh, uh, megawatts. And for for solar PV, uh, it was granted uh, four gigawatts. So, well, one gigawatt for P for wind and and four for for solar PV. So. Um, well, at the end, uh, in general, uh, four gigawatts uh, for wind uh, had to be built before the end of uh, the uh, 2019, 20, 20, uh, the 31st of uh, 2019. Uh, the 20, well, sorry, the 31st of December of 2019 has to be done this amount of uh, power in, in Spain, okay? Uh, so 
I, here in this graph, I gather all that previous uh, figures, and, and there you can see the power granted and the power installed uh, by technology. So in wind, um, it was granted uh, 4 gigawatts, and almost 3 gigawatts were, were installed. Uh, for PV, almost uh, for granted and almost uh, for granted, and for biomass, um, the action that took place in 2016 uh, was everything uh, built. So um, uh, let's see the analysis. Oh, sorry, go back. Okay, here. The analysis of the uh, Spanish auctions for 2016 and 2017, um, we could say that uh, wind and solar promoters demonstrated that uh, it is possible to supply renewable energy by competing with conventional energy because of the cost. It's due to two main aspects, one of the maturity of the technologies and, of course, uh, the reduction of the cost that makes the uh, LCO is uh, very competitive with the rest of conventional uh, technologies. Uh, despite the complexity of, of this, uh, these auctions, uh, it has one advantage that the auction ensures the prof profitability. And in the case the market pool collapses, a regulatory floor appears as a payment for megawatt installed, uh, which is around. Uh, in, 25, 30 euros per megawatt hour. So um, the, the positive thing is that uh, we have a limited time to, to install the project. Uh, those uh, eight gigawatts award in May and June uh, on the 31st of December uh, 2019, almost uh, the 80% managed to be connected. And, and the rest that uh, it wasn't connected mainly was uh, due to administrative issues, delays in permitting. Uh, I know that some companies that were granted with the, in the auctions, maybe they don't were able to, to sell the rights of the, of the uh, auctions uh, to another companies, and, and these things are the main uh, causes of not reaching um, that 20% left that it was not installed. And also, uh, we have to con congratulate the, the operator, the electric system operator and transport operator, because they made a great effort to uh, integrate such amount of uh, new power, new renewable power in the in the in the system. Because as you previously know, it was a, a never never before has been introduced such an uh, such an amount of power in the in the system in one year. Okay, let's move forward. So, well, this is uh, what uh, Hugo Lucas has explained. The, the Royal Decree Law 23, this is the, the short term, uh, uh, the future short term uh, for Spain, the Royal Decree Law 2320, uh, that set a regulatory and energy measures that had been set uh, forth by the Royal Decree Law 2320. And one of the measures is that Sets is that the government will develop another retribution framework for the renewable energy generation through auctions. So the, the Royal Decree Law uh, has grounded the legal basis to redesign the next auctions mechanism. So uh, currently the draft is, um, is, uh, is it is uh, discussing and uh, hopefully uh, uh, let's close the fingers uh, we hope to to come into force as soon as possible even before the end of, of the of the year okay so well this is already has been uh, discussed and even in more detail by Hugo Lucas so uh, specific auctions for technology wind solar PV and biomass auction product is megawatt capacity to install offers based on the energy price or product offer is euro megawatt hour with two decimals pay as bid system a fixed price for energy is offered by a given volume and the right to auction can be combined with the market remuneration for a maximum period of 15 years for auction auctioned energy since then the incomes will come from the pool price or even if in as Hugo has explained in the year you uh, um, 
sell more energy than uh, 3,000 hours. Um, you will receive the pool price also, pre-qualification pre for auction, project identification, access authorization. Is, this is also very important for us because it's important that um, for um, the, the offers, behind that offers, uh, we want to, to really have a real projects uh, behind that, that of that offer. So this is really important to, to have some warranties that uh, uh, before and behind that uh, they are really uh, real projects. And deadlines for administrative maturity and implementation. Okay, uh, so this is the roadmap for uh, the following decade. So uh, almost um, five gigawatts has to be installed every year and uh, of course, the auctions uh, are really a, a great tool to put order, to be effective. Uh, so we, re we really, the sector, uh, really uh, look forward to, to these uh, auctions uh, to be a reality. So this is the, the third scenario that uh, will be for sure in, in, in Spain, in the renewable sector. And uh, here, uh, well, I, I added uh, two slides uh, to, to have an overview of the international auction experience. As you can see, and the, the PV technology has been the most granted in, in the world. Then the onshore and wind, uh, offshore wind, biomass, um, uh, concentrated solar power, smart hydro and biomass. So um, this is uh, an overview which technology are uh, in the, experience, the previous experience has been being granted in the world. Uh, next, next slide uh, here. Um, we we saw the preoccupation. Well, we are really uh, wor worried in in the sector because um, the experience for um, for the international uh, auctions. We see that um, uh, most uh, of the of the auctions uh, are. Um, have delayed or are abandoned. abandoned. So uh, I, we don't really know the, the reasons, but it's important that all the actions uh, take place and get the goals and uh, uh, get the objectives uh, uh, of the power installed. So here, as you can see, uh, as for the solar sector, as for the wind sector, um, uh, except for Brazil, that uh, the the actions are uh, in wind um, on time. The rest of the of the main uh, countries that uh, are um, shown here, uh, they are most delayed or uh, unknown or abandoned. So uh, we really, we are really worried uh, and what uh, hope that this doesn't happen in in Spain or of course in the rest of the of the countries and put all the all the possibilities to to avoid that. Uh, that all the, the auctions uh, reach the, the final goals and get installed in the, in the, in the system. So um, for my final uh, slide, let's see. Okay, uh, some conclusions. Uh, really auctions are a great tool to incorporate the renewable energy into electric systems, are essential for the competitive competitiveness of technology, as well as a backbone for the economy at a social and territorial level. Um, and auctions uh, has to be the result of a prior energy planning process. It's important that we have a plan and then the tools to reach that plan. We, we, we need order and, uh, and of course, uh, auctions are one of the tools. Uh, well, this new auction is scheduled to be held before the end of the year in Spain. However, however it will be crucial to know the timing in the future actions, not only for this year, but for the following uh, ones. We know in, with previous time to know what is going to happen the following years in order to, to plan ourselves. Uh, among the set regulatory and energy policy measures for the fourth by Spain Royal Decree Law of June, uh, uh, auctions to grant the support of renewable electricity is of part 
particular importance and highly expected by the renewable sector, of course, I have said it some, several times before. Um, most of the key design details for the next Spanish auctions on which success of the new scheme will ultimately depend, are pending to be confirmed. So uh, all that Hugo Lucas have talked and, and myself is pending to be confirmed. However, the draft of the new short-term framework is oriented to provide generation with efficiency, effectiveness, flexibility, and diversity market-based rewards. So um, thank you for your your time uh, and and well, I'm I'm really open if any question may arise, uh, I will be very happy to to try to respond thank you okay thanks a lot uh, lucia uh well so far I, I don't see any questions for you uh, there was one question to hugo but he's not here sorry mercedes about uh i mean when he comes back i think we can we can do that okay mm -hmm. uh well just uh the, the audience please notice that uh, we, we have done so far is to go to, through the uh you know, the impact of the past auctions. And also we have looked at the, at the next generation of auctions in Spain. The, you should be aware that there is a, there's a big difference between the auctions designed between 2016 and 2017 and the uh, auctions that are being designed now. So, uh, you know, we are combining these, these, these two perspectives. On the one hand, what happened and what was the impact of what happened of, of, the, of the previous design, and also uh, focus on uh, future design. Okay, and also we combine the government view, which uh, Google gave us, with the uh, company's views uh, provided by uh, Lucia and by the next presenter, uh, who is, uh, Heike Wisted, uh, thanks a lot. Thank you for being here. He's from the Spanish Wind Energy Association. And he will uh, talk us uh, about um, uh, the challenge of auctions in Spain and particularly the impact on, on the supply chain. Thanks a lot. Heike, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Pablo, and thank you all the organizers for uh, inviting us to be here today. and and share a little bit of thoughts about uh, the impacts uh, of um, regulatory changes and uh, changing from filling tariffs to auctions and how that can impact also on the industry in this case the, the wind power industry and uh, just to be try to be as fast as possible but not to leave anything behind um my first if i can change okay perfect um well we, we <laughs> we are in a situation, if you look at, at least from the point of view, the wind power sector in Spain, where we have a clear idea of where the, the both the European Union and the, the, the Spanish government wants us to go, and we are perfectly, perfectly, um, let's say, geared up to go in that direction. But the problem is that, well, the problem, there, there are so many issues that has to be taking into consideration at the moment that the sector has uh, not just wind but all the renewable sector has uh, increased its um, uh, let's say um, complex it, it, the, the system is much more complex and there are so many issues that you have to take into consideration in order to to move forward because the more of course the renewables you have the more complex the system becomes to to make it uh, work but it is it is it is the challenge and we are going to step up to this challenge but the, for instance but as you can see in this uh, slide we have um all these things into our minds and thank god because then i have a lot of work to do uh, and 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 keeps me keeps me busy all day but uh, yeah we have uh, very very um, uh, ambitious uh, targets for 2030 in wind you have uh, to install 2.2 uh, 2.3 gigawatts of wind uh, in spain and the, the government has said that the system that to be used to mainly to be used uh, for uh, to achieve these objectives is, is auctions but of course the more we have all these other issues how are you going to uh, for uh, for the promoters of wind farms, how you're going to 
to, to do your, your bit of work? Uh, are you going to finance through just uh, on a market basis or are you going to, to auctions? Are you going to do PPAs? All these facts are need to be taken into consideration. We have to think whether it's more interesting to uh, make the existing plants uh, hybrid in, uh, with um, solar or uh, adding also storage. Um, all these issues uh, had to be taken into consideration, and it, it had this has an impact, of course, on the on the not just on the promoter side, but also on the industry industrial side. As you can see in the in the in this graph, um, the evolution of wind power in Spain has has for the moment has one one period, big period where where the, there were almost uh, 2,000 megawatts installed every year for a long period between 1998 and, and 2012, uh, thanks to the feed-in tariffs. Uh, and then there was this period, uh, let me see. We uh, have this period here where there is nothing is installed after 2012 uh, until almost 2017 where there was this, as Lucia was uh, mentioning, there was this uh, moratorium in the, in the oh, oh, there was a stop. This is very, it's not, this is very specific, specific for Spain, but this is something that has happened in other countries. We can, we have, if we look back at uh, in, uh, in um, Denmark, in Denmark, they had a similar period uh, in between 2003 and 2007, where they were changing the system from feeding tariffs to to something more 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 advanced, let's say, uh, in that sense. So every country that, that changes systems uh, usually has this. If it, there are radical changes, like from feeding tariffs to offer, and in, in most cases there are these gaps. There are these gaps where the government starts thinking about other ways of, of promoting renewables, and that creates uh, this hiatus in the development of renewables, which can vary between two to four or even five years, as you can see the case in, in, in Spain. This, this, of course, has effects. Uh, if you think about how, the, how in Spain, uh, during this period of the feeding tariffs, um, at the same time, with a, you can, you can Think that if you have a market of about 2,000 megawatts per year, it's a very propitious market to have an industry, and that was actually the case. Uh, Spain, Spain had developed a, a very, very strong uh, industrial uh, manufacturing uh, base for wind power. During this period, uh, there were several companies that uh, achieved uh, an international relevance, like uh, Gamesa, Acciona, or and, uh, um, sorry, uh, um, the previous one, that, uh, I can't remember the name now, it's, I'm getting old, I know, but uh, uh, there, there, was, there were other two, two companies which were also in the international markets. Um, and, the, and, and that was basically the result of this, this uh, growing market. Where, and, and the fact was that these, this, um, these factories, uh, wind power factories, were providing mostly for the Spanish market. What happened next is that uh, when the, the market for wind installations stopped growing in Spain, uh, was that uh, these uh, factories started uh, exporting most of the production uh, to, to many the, the other markets that were still growing, especially in, uh, in, in America, both North and South, and, uh, and Asia, and also in, in, in Oceania. Uh, so this is, this is uh, the, the, the actual um, work of the, 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 the industry still continued, but uh, not for the, as I said, not for the Spanish market. Then what happened? The problem is when, when you are only, um, let's say, only working uh, for exports, uh, you are not able to foresee what will be the because there is no legislation in, in, in Spain for new for new installations or to 
it's, it's difficult to foresee what is going to be the development of uh, the, the next phase of growth of for wind power in your own market. And uh, the, the coming of the auctions, with the, as, as Lucia was uh, explaining, these auctions that had a very peculiar um, design, as, as you, you, you have analyzed in the ORIS, uh, in the ORIS project um, very well, and thank you for that because we have learned a lot of the have, have got a lot of insights from your your studying of the Spanish auction system. Um, this has created, uh, uh, as always, uh, with with auctions, uh, a lot of pressure on uh, wind manufacturing uh, on the industrial side because when you have feed-in tariffs, um, there is uh, an adjustment of the prices of the wind turbines are adjusted to the level of the feeding tariffs. While in the auctions, the, the auctions, you don't know the result of the auctions, uh, or other, or the manufacturers uh, get to, to an agreement with the, with the promoters in order to, to have a clear idea of, uh, of what is the level of the offers that uh, are going to be presented at the auctions. And so they, they go, uh, together, so there is a clear agreement on, on on what how low you can get, or you can have situations where in the auctions uh, the promoters make offers without really having closed the price with the with the wind manufacturers. So in in that case, you you have a dangerous situation where after winning the auction, you might have uh, you might have. Uh, uh, promoters uh, shopping around to see where you can get these cheap uh, these cheap wind turbines that adjust to your uh, that adjust to your needs in order to be uh, profitable and the problem is uh, for spain is that what happened here during this period for the auctions is that most of the projects were um that were available, the projects that were, had the permitting in place, uh, not even all of them, uh, they had the permit in place, they had the old machines, the old technology from 2010 and to, to, to 2012, machines of one to two megawatt of size, mostly, so, and some of them may, might have had three, but the problem was that with these machines, you, uh, with, with these machines, you cannot achieve the levels of reduction in the in the the the, uh, the price of the electricity (LSOE) of the of the projects um, or the or the cost of the energy of the projects that are, were needed in order to be profitable on the auctions. You needed the machines that were bigger than that, uh, modern machines with three to up to five megawatts of size, mostly. Um, so, and that created a problem. One of the problems was that uh, all the permits that had these old, uh, old machines in the permits needed to be updated. Uh, and that is a long administrative procedure in some, in some regions. And that's why some of the, many of the projects were actually delayed and did not come into, into, into they were not connected in 2019 uh, as was expected, so, but they have been more, many of them have been connected in 2020 uh, with uh, with six or nine months of delay. So the, that that was a problem created by this change in the legislation and also change in the in the technology. Uh, and so the problem for as you can, will probably you can will be seeing in the next uh, slide. Let's see if I can change it. Okay. Not this one. Okay, this is a, a slide where it tells you how much money or how much was each of the subsectors in the wind power sector contributing to Spanish GDP in a, in a period of time from 2005 to 2019. Uh, why I put this graph is that you can see here that in the first period when uh, there was this expansion under the feeding tariff until almost 2010, the the, the subsector that was contributing the most to the to the Spanish GDP was the industrial one, um, and it had almost 50% of the contribution of the overall wind power sector was coming from manufacturers. 
So you could see that the manufacturers were capturing of the growth of the market, they were capturing, uh, uh, well, 50% of, 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 this, of this growth. Uh, promoters were in, uh, in the 30, in the 30 percent average and the service sector was in the has, hasn't changed much overall on, on the time about uh, 20 up to 20 percent what we see here this is very important to take into consideration also for the future and it's that in 2000 and you can see there uh, there was there's a one year here particularly where almost the manufacturers don't uh, actually contribute anything and all everything is almost uh, done by the promoters why is this and why is in 2011 in 12 you remember that in 2012 there was this moratorium um, but the, in fact the quest the fact is that the, if you have this stop in the in the in the in the new installations of course you have a stop in the in the contracts for new for new for new turbines, so you can see that the in this period, in these three years, the Spanish, uh, when the industrial sector had to readjust itself from having an own market to become an exporting market, which is the second phase here. This is all exports. This this uh, there are no almost no contribution to the to the Spanish market because there were no new installations. So you can see here in 2018 and 2019 a little bit of a jump because the, the Spanish market took uh, took uh, again a certain uh, it, it increased the, the request for new for new for new turbines. But coming to and this is important to take into consideration if if you have of course the the promoters more or less. Uh, of course, they suffered when they, they, there was this cut in the in the in the retribution of the installations. There was a, a, almost thirty between thirty and forty percent cut in in some of the installations uh, of the of the feed-in tariff that was changed to this uh, to this capacity incentive. But in any case, they they they, they manage to survive and, 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 and thanks also to higher market prices in some of the years, they, they have kept their contribution to Spanish GDP. For the manufacturer, it's much more difficult to survive in an environment where there's no market, as you can see here and here, in 2012 and 13, and they have, as I said, to readapt and go for exports, uh, which they were quite successful. But the problem is, of course, you, you, as long as you have, as you have uh, income and you can you can uh, improve your your technology, uh, you be, you you stay competitive and you can you can continue exporting because you are better you have better products than other than other competitors. Um, but here we have we have the, the, some kind of a problem in Spain because. Uh, the, the factories where uh, for wind industry are located in many cases in, in inland Spain, not close to the to harbors, because they were thought for machines of, as I said, the beginning of machines one, two megawatts. And those are relatively easy to move around in, in, in inland Spain uh, and relatively easy to take to the harbors and export. But if you go for machines of uh, four or five megawatts and the blades that go with these machines, um, this is uh, the, the, the location of the of the factories can be a problem. And you have to adapt the the transport, uh, the highways, you have to adapt uh, bridges, you have to adapt uh, tunnels, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the, the challenge for, uh, in the Span in the, for the Spanish industrial Industrial uh, subsector for wind wind subsector is uh, is to adapt now to these new te new technologies, new bigger technologies with a new system of auctions, and and coming back to this this graph, it is important to take into consideration that um, this, the, there is a gap in time between 
if you have an auction, for instance, if you have an auction this year, um, which we think we will have, as Lucia was saying, um, the the uh, the, 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 the contracts to buy the turbines will only come next year. That for because most most probably the 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 installations will be installed in two thousand and uh, starting two thousand and and twenty one uh, twenty two not in in twenty one because uh, with all the, the 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 construction and the permitting and everything once the 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 auction has been awarded, you might think almost two years in order to have the, the wind farms completed. So for the for the industrial industrial sector to have since 2018, uh, when it was announced that there will be a change in the legislation and there will be a new system of of, of uh, auctions, this has of course created an expectation in most of promoters that uh, there will be an re auctions and that means that the other options that are available to promote wind farms like PPAs or or um, go merchant they the interest for these options for wind at least have been decreasing and we have seen this in the in the in the public uh, numbers of of um, contracts for for new uh, wind uh, wind turbines like uh, at this time of the year last year there were almost 800 megawatts of wind turbine orders at this year we have only 375 uh, megawatts in wind turbine orders for the future so this is because we think that uh, most of the promoters obviously are waiting for the wind for the auctions before committing themselves to buying the 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 wind wind turbines, which makes sense, and uh, you uh, and so the the effect that the the the, the auctions are having of on the wind wind industrial subsector is this always waiting for the auctions. So if there are no auctions, there are no there are no contracts or almost no contracts. So this creates a lot of pressure on on the industrial sector. To uh, to survive actually uh, without uh, having a clear idea on when the contracts will actually arrive, and so we go back to what uh, Lucia was also saying. It would have been very good to have a clear um, uh, um, schedule for auctions uh, a year ago, not. But of course, the situation in Spain with legal and, and government and everything is was complicated. So we understand that it was no easy, no easy to have this uh, schedule. But if you had had the schedule, then it would have been much easier to, for everybody to plan uh, their their um, their investments and uh, and also for the industry to clearly see when the my contracts might come. So in order to to I'm I'm going to finish. Uh, this is the last uh, slide. We have, as I said, we need to install 2.2, 2.3 gigawatts of wind uh, in the in every year, every year uh, from here to 2030, and in, and after that probably almost the same. And the wind power sector has another challenge, which is to repower all the wind farms, um, where uh, it is expected that almost 18 gigawatts will have to be repowered by 2030. So, for in order to capture these ambitious, uh, the, the the benefits of both economic, social, economical, and macroeconomical of these ambitious targets, it is very important to have uh, a schedule for for um, for uh, auctions, a specific technology of auctions, as you can see in the objectives that the Spanish NCP has. The it is very ambitious for every technology. So there, there is no need to have technologies as neutral auctions because in that case the challenge for the for the wind power wind power industry could be even bigger because uh, <laughs> there will be there will be uh, it will have to to compete with uh, mostly uh, non Asian manufacturers of PV panel and, and other components. 
uh, so it will be much more difficult to maintain the the the, the Spanish wind, wind industrial sector. So in order to, as I said, in order to capture the maximum potential for the Spanish and European also economy, it is important that the auctions are technology separated uh, because we, we are sure that the, the, it is important to, to, for us it is important to maintain the, the competitiveness uh, of, the, of the wind, uh, European and, and Spanish wind, wind the industrial uh, sector. Okay. And it's important in that case that, uh, and that is my last uh, remark, it is important also that given that there's a very little margin in the sale of wind turbines, especially for onshore, it's very important that the European Union keeps uh, uh, important uh, R&D programs for, uh, for, the, for the keeping the competitiveness of wind onshore and of course of, also offshore but important programs with, with good funding uh, for Spanish, not only companies, but also uh, Spanish and European, but also uh, in, in research institutes. And well, what those more or less were my last remarks. And thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thanks a lot, Heiki. Uh, we got a question for you, a very, very short one. Uh, Xavier asks uh, if there are specific targets for offshore wind power or even floating offshore winds. Um, yeah, well, the, the, in Spain, the, the, as you can see in, here in the, oh, sorry. The target is a joint target of on and offshore wind uh, that was included in the last revision of the NECP. Um, the, there are no, for the moment, no offshore targets, but specific. But uh, we are the, the government. And who, if Hugo was there, he could probably tell a little bit more what um, we are working together. With, we are uh, in coordination. The government is working in coordination with us. To, to do a specific um, st uh, strategy for offshore in 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 Spain, and we are we think that there is a, there is easily the 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 space for 2,000 3,000 megawatts of offshore, especially for uh, for islands and uh, in the north of Spain, mm, um, and that is our more or less our position. We think that also that we have proposed a project um, of 300 megawatts by to be developed by to, to be connected by 2025 in the Canary Islands. There is a lot of interest from many companies. Um, so this is this is more or less the situation. But uh, once we have the strategy finished for offshore, then we'll have a clear clear uh, picture. Okay. Um... Okay, that, uh, Natasha has uh, a question. We are, we are a little bit bad uh, uh, in time, but uh, uh, there, is a, there is a question for Lucia Tolera, uh, who is, maybe she's not there. Lucia, are you there? Uh, no, I don't see her, okay. Um, Okay, well, uh, I will leave her uh, the question. Th thanks, Natasha. I will ask her uh, after she comes back. Also, there's a, another question for Wu, who is not here. So the two, uh, that is a bad luck uh, to have uh, left, uh, at least uh, momentarily, uh, by Cristina Peñasco asking if there is, um, well, if, uh, there is a, a mechanism or some type of uh, uh, incentive for small producers, I could say there is actually uh, actual diversity is one of the, of the uh, I, I'm not Lugo, Lucas, of course, but uh, he, since he is not here, I can answer that. Uh, uh, actual diversity is uh, a bit of a, a new objective in the, in the new auctions uh, as reflected in the Royal Decree law and also in the draft uh, Royal Decree. Um, okay, well, so, so much for the moment. Uh, we, we are uh, hurry now because uh, we have the, the next presenter who is myself. Um, uh, we will take all these questions uh, when these guys uh, are back and try to ask them if they are back. I hope so. 
uh, well, I think it is very important what Heike, uh, Heike's presentation, and uh, in, in, in a way there is, uh, you know, some time of continuation on my presentation here, because uh, Heike, thanks a lot for providing this uh, wind uh, industry insights, uh, which is uh, very, very interesting because one of the objectives of this project was exactly that, provide an, an analysis on the um on this uh, impacts on, on the renewable energy sector and particularly on on wind okay uh, so i should uh, yeah okay so well first i will uh, i will give you some immense insights from our empirical analysis on the impact of auctions on the supply chain well, first of uh, a small introduction on this. Um, well, it is our our starting point takes into account that the key feature of options is the competitive pressure which is uh, created on the overall value chain. So, uh, in addition, uh, it is also often argued that options can induce a reduction in the level of actor diversity. So, uh, Christina Peñasco's question is also related to this. Uh, and this reduction in actor diversity occurs in such seg segments of the value chain, and especially in the pre-development sector. So, in the process of design and an auction, policymakers must make specific decisions and, uh, related to the auction design elements. And depending on those decisions, auctions may favor certain types of actors over others. And this may lead to increased levels of market concentration. Well, in this uh, in, in this uh, project, we have carried out an empirical analysis uh, on the following two topics, which are not easy, by the way. Uh, defining market concentration as uh, the number and diversity of firms. On the one hand, we, we have looked at the impacts of different auction design elements on market concentration, number and diversity of firms, in two, uh, two stages of the value chain, product development and uh, uh, component manufacturing. On the other hand, uh, we have also looked at the relative impact of auctions and design elements in auctions compared to other context factors. We know auctions are not the, all the, everything. Uh, they are, there are also other factors affecting uh, 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 market concentration and, uh, in general, the impact on the industry, as also Heike uh, mentioned in his second slide. So uh, we also look at, 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 those, uh, at those two factors. Okay, so, um, well, then we, we, we analyze the impact of the several design elements. Uh, these were the ones chosen for the analysis. Uh, they were the ones a priori believed to have a minimum full impact on the number and diversity of firms in those two stages. Uh, material pre-qualification requirements on projects or bidders are the requirements to be met to participate in the bidding procedure. So they must apply to the specification of the offer project and to the bidder, uh, and they can be very stringent or they can be very lenient. So, you know, we, we have both, both alternatives. We have also financial pre-qualification requirements which refer to the economic guarantees that the bidder has to provide in order to participate in the auction. They can also be very stringent or very lax. The issue of technology neutrality, auctions can be organized. So different types of renewable energy technologies can participate in the auction or only one renewable energy technology can participate in the auction. Um, then we have project size limitations, which can be either minimum or maximum. Uh, the issue of the schedule, which I think uh, already Heike touched. So for us, it was also a, a very important design element influencing the number and diversity of actors. And uh, so we chose this uh, also for the analysis and the high frequency of auctions as well. Um, whether we have price uh, only auctions which are organized only uh, on one criteria, which is the big price or multi criteria auctions, uh, can also uh, could also have uh, an impact on this regard. Then uh, there are basically two different ways to set support levels uh, uniform pricing versus bias bids. This is uh, also well known. And there are several instruments to send the remuneration for energy, including feeding tariffs and feeding premiums, uh, whether they are fixed or sliding. Uh, well, uh, the realization period refers to deadlines of the for the project awarded contracts uh, to be built. So, um, okay. 
So in order to get this uh, in-depth understanding of how the design elements in office options influence project developers and equipment manufacturers, uh, country and technology level case studies were carried out based on the structure interviews with key experts in, in several countries. Uh, actually, these were Peru for solar PV and wind power, Spain for onshore wind power, South Africa for solar PV and wind power and, and CSP, and the United Kingdom for uh, offshore wind. Oh, which, okay. Uh, okay, well, we used uh, expert licitation based interviews. Um, so the interview experts were selected based on they being very well acquainted with the country level auction program and uh, having significant knowledge on the value chain um, particularly regarding, regarding project development and component manufacturing so the selected experts came from a broad range of backgrounds we had policy makers energy sector and market experts stakeholders from financial institutions uh, renewable energy industry association representatives as well as, as other um, actors. So they were asked to provide their perception on the influence of uh, the design elements uh, on several, uh, uh, and also complex factors on the number and diversity of firms in, in the two stages that we, I, I just mentioned. And they were also self, uh, I mean, they were asked to self-assess the level of expertise uh, well, the, uh, the expert judgments were recorded via liquid scales, uh, as, as in the sample provided in the picture. So they have, we have this 11 uh, point liquid scale uh, with, uh, you know, going from a very, very small impact or to very, very strong impact. Okay. Um, so 33 expert interviews were completed in the four countries during March to July. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, uh, so 33 expert interviews were carried out uh, between March and to July. Uh, well, you can see the, the segregation per country in the, the figures, uh, you know, per country and also uh, per technology and also per type of stakeholder. Okay. Um, well, regarding the findings, um we found out that options and option design elements have a marked effect on the number and diversity of pre developers and component manufacturers and the expert licitation process has established support for the existence of these uh, impactful design elements uh, so uh, these design elements make a difference but um I mean, uh, in, in, in general, uh, these design elements tend to affect the, the, uh, the value chains of the four considered countries in quite similar ways, uh, in, in the sense that the, the direction of the influence is uh, similar, but um, there are substantial technology and country differences regarding the intensity of the influence. Um, well, this is in line with our idea that the impact of auction design elements can be expected to be renewable energy technology specific and also country specific. So the uh, design elements which tend to affect the number and diversity of firms to a greater of, uh, extent are the frequency of uh, auction rounds, the existence of, uh, of a transparent auction schedule you know, connecting also to, to previous presentations and pre-qualification pre requirements. Um, and also they are the ones uh, that are more likely or most likely to get tangled up with non-auction policy areas such as industrial policy and wider economic policy making, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, um, so the relative importance uh, of, of the perceived impact of auctions uh, on the design elements uh, can be observed uh, on the graphs, uh, you know, on the, on the right, where we have plotted uh, in, um, in the uh, x-axis, we have all the design elements. In the y-axis, we have the, uh, you know, the impact where it is positive or it is negative and the intensity of the effect. The different design elements. So what we can see is that the relative importance of the perceived impact of auction design elements on the number of diversity of project developers and component manufacturers across all case case study uh, countries is uh, is similar. We uh, uh, we can see a, a broad spread 
in terms of how design elements affect the number and diversity of firms. Um, so the positive and negative impacts of uh, specific design elements on, on uh, the number and diversity of firms are perceived to be much more pronounced in general for project developers than they are for component manufacturers. Um, well, certain design elements have a uh, strong positive uh, or negative impact on the number and diversity of project developers. This refer to basically uh, the, the, the schedule, as it, I mean, the, the having a schedule there and uh, on the negative side, the uh, pre very, very stringent pre-qualification uh, requirements. Okay, so um, the relative, uh, the perceived relative importance of auctions, which has, was also one of our uh, main uh, research areas. I mean, auctions are not the whole thing. Uh, they vary considerably across countries with uh, respect to the number, to their impact on the number and diversity of firms. But in general terms, we can say that um, uh, interview experts uh, had a diverging uh, views as to whether auctions, uh, design auction design elements or context conditions uh, are most important. Okay? This confirms that uh, it is not only auctions that matter in this regard, but also other factors uh, are very important as well. And um, yeah, well, this is it. Um, I don't know if we have, um, yeah, okay, so this is it. I don't have questions so far, but I may have later. That's fine. I do have a time to look into my questions for myself, for me being a presenter. So if there's questions, I will answer them later on no problem um so uh, but there so far there is none uh, there are none uh, so next next uh, slide next presenter will be oscar thanks oscar for uh, for being there uh, I, I i mean now it's the turn of my ores project uh, partners uh, we are a little bit in a hurry so i would ask you to please uh, provide uh, these your presentations you know, as fast as possible, but uh, I mean, take your time. You have your time anyway, but uh, go through it. Okay, thanks a lot. Great, right. thanks very much Pablo. And thank you everybody else um, for, for attending and for the presentation so far. Um, so my talk is slightly different, I think in, in perspective from the other talks. Um, so rather than looking at the, the detail of specific current and short term or, um, auction processes, I'm gonna look slightly further afield and slightly further into the future. So a couple of qualifications. The main one is that none of the talk refers to a specific market context. It's a, a generalized European context. Um, so I, I wouldn't read anything into any of the findings that, that I present because they don't relate to any specific real current markets. Um, and, and the second one is that this is quite um, speculative and it's more of a framework than a set of conclusions. Um, and there's still an, an ongoing discussion about this work. Let me see if I can change the slide. I can. Um, so th the inspiration for this work has got quite a provocative title, The End of Auctions, to present this right in the middle of a talk about a very specific and detailed um, implementation of auctions. Um, and, but the inspiration here is to sort of start from the point that often auctions are talked about as a transitional instrument from what, what came before, which is the feed-in tariff, towards something in the future, which is not very so not, often not talked about in great de great deal of detail but often it's assumed that this may be some private contracting or merchant basis for, for renewable development investment in the future and the auctions are often presented as this um, in this middle step between the two and um, without very much definition about what happens later and i think approaching it from this perspective gives us gives us an opportunity to look more carefully at what we mean by auctions um, uh, and then to start thinking about how this concept may be applied in the future. And I think this is interesting for a few reasons. The first is, as an academic, this is a good research topic to look into. Um, the second is we've got a very good resource now with the, the ongoing oil projects, a good understanding of renewable energy auctions. And I think looking for ways that we can apply that knowledge in the future is a good one. But the final one is, I think it's really good to have a conversation starting now about the very long term, about how these contracting issues um, may play out as an industry, um, as a sector, and as, as, as a sort of a community around renewables to think about these topics in the longer term. And one of the things that the auction concept is very good at is being very flexible. Um, 
At the moment, we have a kind of quite fixed idea that it's a public policy instrument that provides renewable energy support. But that's not necessarily the case. We could do it in various different ways. We come up with a broader definition of auctions in which we are less, um, we're more agnostic about the auctioneer and, and the other participants, as well as the products being exchanged. Um, so we've come up with a, a fairly broad definition, which captures current auctions, but may open future alternatives as well. So the kind of things we're interested in is what, what, what role really will auctions play in the long term? And we're talking about well beyond 2030, more like 2050 here, when we're talking about the long term future. Um, and when we start to think of those questions, we're thinking about some of the really big trends which define the electricity system um, and broader social um, and economic trends. Um, but fundamentally, we're talking about the routes to market, how electricity from renewable uh, energy generation meets its buyers um, and the, the regulatory and commercial arrangements between the two. So one, one of the things we've done over the summer is generate a, a framework to try and understand some of the possible trade-offs and implications of the choices and trends that happen between now and 2050. We've come up with this framework which has two primary axes. Um, there's a horizontal and a vertical one and in this, uh, in this slide you can see that the vertical one distinguishes between levels of flexibility. One of the big trends I, I saw in, in Heike's slide earlier is this idea of flexibility. And we can see this developing in all sorts of ways, new forms of storage, new contracting arrangements. Um, the way that we cope with more variable renewables in a system is going to have lots of a big spectrum of different outcomes really now in 2050. So there's with a great deal of uncertainty, but it's certainly a key driver in how the system will look in the future. And on the horizontal axis is this concept of decentralization. Um, and, and by de decentralization, we mean a whole host of different things, actually. So it's smaller plants, uh, less decentralized physical architecture to the system, but also more social changes such as decision making and ownership moving away from the center towards the periphery of the system. So these two axes, one is technically driven and requires a certain amount of social adaptation, which is the flexible one. And then the decentralization one hooks into ideas of um, uh, energy democracy and other so it's a, so, a more of a social trend which requires a certain amount of technical adaptation. So we've got these two, we think, contrasting uh, axes that allow us to define four separate versions of the future, which we've done when and given them given them some names. And I'll quickly run through each of them. Um, so we've got the more flexible, less these. Uh, so I'll, I'll go straight into them. Actually, I think it's the quickest way to do this. But the key sort of analytical unit we're considering here of what the future, what the routes to market may be. So we can go from something like we have today, which is a public policy, renewable energy auction, guaranteeing supplements to income. Um, but as we've seen in various markets under some conditions, corporate PPAs, and I think we could expand that concept of the private PPA as a, as a key financing mechanism more broadly to include other actors. Um, there's a concept perhaps um, a, a possibility we, we could we could return to a more fixed price um, approach such as the feed-in tariff or there's straightforward merchant contracting in which uh, which generators trade in wholesale markets and obviously the balance between these routes to market is determined to, we think to a great extent by the, the two axes that we set out so I'll very quickly run through the four different versions and then I'll give you some links to, to follow to read the report well, one more thing. Um, we assume that in all of these worlds, we, we, we sort of assume that by the middle of the century, the main decarbonisation goals, which broadly speaking is a very high proportion of renewables, um, electricity system decarbonisation decarbonization by 2050 across the board. And I think just to be specific, we're talking about renewable energy auctions for electricity production um, rather than some of the other things, because we can see auctions being used to allocate um, seabed tenure for offshore wind, for example, um, and other balancing things. So we're talking specifically about um, output here. Okay, so the first one we call shiny, happy energy citizens, and this is kind of a, a utopian uh, universe where we have quite a high flexibility, high decentralization um, tendency. So this is where the trends that we're seeing currently in the marketplace are taken to a quite, quite, um, quite high level. So there's a lot of local governance and there's a lot of um, uh, system management at a local scale, at the distribution scale, and a great deal of demand side response. So it's a highly flexible system 
that allow very accurate valuation system services and local markets for uh, renewable energy and, uh, and quite broad social participation in the system. So lots of cooperatives and um, behind the meter installations and so on. And the implications here for routes to market and renewable energy auctions is that we can see both private and public procurement driven in, the, in this market. So um, we may well have national auctions, but we may have local auctions. We may well have public ones, but we may have, well have community and private ones as well. Um, and one thing we may also see, if we, we talked about it a few times here in the supply chain, is there could be some regulatory input to sort of manage some of the implications of auctions. And this could be local content, it could be trying to um, manage network impact, but we could imagine a system where we have a private set of contracting arrangements which are regulated to a greater or lesser extent for some social benefits. The second one is where we have a much lower level of decentralization. So we have quite a centralized system, um, both, both democratically and physically, but also a high level of flexibility. So we have the governance is very much from the top down perhaps, but we have quite active system management because we have a lot of um, understanding and flexibility in how to manage the system at that high level. And the great opportunities for demand side response, for example, and, it, the, and the wholesale markets at a national and maybe transnational levels are, are able to accurately value the services, so there's quite good hedging opportunities. But one of the key characteristics is that incumbent large firms tend to dominate electricity production here, and there's much less of the community level action that we saw in the last slide. Um, and, and here we're seeing um, perhaps a larger um, expansion of the, the corporate PPA models of private procurement, large um, demand loads meeting up with with um, suppliers to contract on a bilateral basis perhaps through auctions um, if we can standardize products in some way in the future um, we see mu a much smaller role here for um, inserting some regulatory oversight on how those contracts are managed um, for example local content is much less likely um, and here we have one we've called make do and mend which this is um, a bottom-up citizen-led um, transition if, to 2050, but some of the technologies that, were, that are required and the regulatory innovation required to allow the system flexibility doesn't happen at the same pace. So here we have quite a quite a, um, a rootsy local governance approach where energy cooperatives and um, both on the supply and the demand side of the market are very active, but the markets themselves don't function as well as they might do if we had higher levels of flexibility. Nevertheless, there's um, a great deal of uh, local activity in, in, on, on both sides and a really broad participation. And this might re result in, for, for example, energy efficiency playing a really big role in meeting the goals for 2050. Um, and so the, the, the role for um, national and transnational level auctions is, is reduced somewhat in this, in this scenario. And um, local and community scale actors working together to try and uh, try and manage the demand side probably more than the, um, the the supply side. And one concept that could we see emerge in this scenario is something which is analogous to the corporate PPA model, and um, is this community PPA where communities are actively coming together not to build um, res infrastructure but to to contract themselves to meet their local demands. Um, and obviously there's a, there's a lot of standardization and, and regulatory innovation to get to that point, but we think that's this scenario gives that opportunity. And then this, this final one, which is, um, we've called Leviathan, this is a very um, low level of decentralization. So um, we're talking about incumbent domination um, and very little participation as well, as well at the same time as very low flexibility. Um, so the system itself doesn't price things very well, and we have quite low, uh, quite low levels of uh, of flexibility. So we end up with a national system with centralised networks that generally work on a, a passive basis, um, uh, and, and again, in, uh, dominance by incumbent firms. And some of the risks we think here are that electricity markets are extremely high risk environments, particularly for independent producers at the smaller end. Um, and we can imagine a situation where in order to meet demand, which is extremely inflexible, uh, incumbent utilities are offering PPAs which have to be regulated. And if this system doesn't work, which we see is quite a high risk, as we move towards 2050, this is the scenario in which 
a, a return to a feed-in tariff as a last desperate push to perhaps get enough renewables onto the system um, as fast as possible could be required. So just giving you a very quick overview through our four scenarios that we've developed. This is just a framework for thinking and we're still interested in gathering input. So there's a survey that's live, which we'll send a, a link around to it, um, either in the email or in the chat. Um, but the, the main headline finding is that we think that in all of these scenarios, there's still a really strong role for auctions. Um, we think there's probably a hybrid of approaches when it comes to routes to market as applicable in all of these different scenarios. But exactly how we um, how we end up at each of these is really dependent on some of these trends. Now, we have a report which outlines the findings and um, we're very happy to provide for you to provide input on that because that's not being finalized until the end of this month. So you've got another week if you want to read the report, reflect on it on your own time. And there's a survey to capture some of that input if you'd like to make it. Um, and then once we've sort of finalized that report, which will nail down this framework for understanding what auctions look like in the future, we think there are other opportunities to sort of model some of the economic implications. Um, and to look more closely at the kind of innovation that's required to bring some of these merchant and PPA products forward, if that if that's something that we think is, is likely to happen. And then perhaps possibly expanding our scope to look beyond just looking at the, um, the production uh, auctions, but to look at other parts of the system where auctions may be applied, seabed tenure being one I've mentioned already, and that's something that's actively happening here in the UK with offshore wind. Um, and we wonder whether there's some overlap between the things that we've learned through ORES and some of those other auction systems. So um, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot, Oscar. I hope I kept, uh, kept the time a bit. <laughs> yeah yeah thanks for the timing also okay we are really bad uh but in time but uh there was a question for lucia i think it's good that uh, she can answer it because she has to leave um the question is by, by natasha uh, lucia uh, natasha asked uh, how did spain spain manage to fight for the technology specifics in their auction before the european commission if I got it right, they had technology specific auctions. Does she know, do you know, what was this main reason the European Commission accepted uh, the request, uh, the request of Spain for that model? I don't know if you can answer it. Uh, it might be more for Hugo also, <laughs> but uh, yeah, okay. Well, let's hope that uh, this question is uh, for Hugo mostly because he's the one who was uh, mostly involved in that. Um, okay. Well, um, I think you can also answer her bilaterally on the on the chat as well. I mean, that would be if something you know occurs to you on, on your mind. Um, but uh, okay, let's go with the next presenter. Uh, uh felix uh, von blucher from guidehouse who will talk us about uh, cross-border auctions uh thanks uh, felix for for being here and the floor is yours thanks thank you pablo um hello everyone my name is felix von blucher i'm managing consultant at guidehouse uh, formerly known as uh, navigant and of course we're also part of the rs2 consortium um, the aim of my presentation today, and I will try to stick to the 10 minutes, um, is to give you a short uh, overview of uh, cross-border auctions and why we believe that they will be um, of increasing importance in the future, and um, to also give you a short introduction on a new um, instrument at EU level, which is the refinancing mechanism, which will facilitate renewable auctions um, across European member states. Uh, ah, yeah, I do have control. Perfect. So, um, what do I mean by cross-border auctions? Um, first of all, consider two countries, country A and country B, and they both um, implement nationally their own renewables auctions. Um, but instead, um, they could also join forces and jointly conduct an auction, which then is open to um, the participation of bidders from both countries. Um, and thus automatically results in competition between projects from, from those two countries, um, with the result that, of course, only the, 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 the best or the cheapest um, 
projects or those that require the least support will um, will win in the auction be awarded and typically this means that cross-border auctions will then result um, in the cross-border flow of support payments and corresponding renewables statistics um, between the countries involved. Now why do they make sense um, in the first Place. There's a couple of uh, reasons which I would just like to shortly present. The main most important reason is of course because they have um, the potential to significantly reduce support payments for the countries involved um, and that's uh, due to several reasons. First of all because they uh, allow tapping into areas um, that have better natural resource potential meaning higher full load hours per project. Um, but also to tap into other markets that have higher market values um, for those for renewables technologies, which means that on top of the market revenues that are generated, um, less support payments are needed for those projects. And we are also still seeing um, variations between the costs of capital um, in, in European countries. And, and those, of course, have a strong bearing on the overall project costs. Um, another reason is uh, to, to, to consider um, implementing cross-border auctions is to increase competition and this is particularly relevant for countries that either have an immature renewables market so far or have a very small market or just have a don't have a very like, like a depleted um, project uh, pipeline and uh, they could consider implementing cross-border auctions or opening their national auction to um, projects um, in, in other countries to, to increase the competition in their domestic scheme and thus uh, improve the functioning of the auction. And last but not least, cross-border auctions can be a mean to um, serve um, the transfer of knowledge between countries and to test different designs. And this is interesting because um, yeah, across European states, we see a, a large variety in auction designs being implemented and tested. And so by co jointly conducting auctions, um, it, it, it could be a means to actually um, tr uh, Im yeah, improve the exchange of best practice. Now, despite all these um, advantages um, or potential of cross-border auctions, we have seen very limited, um, limited cross-border cooperation so far. And especially also cross-border auctions. In fact, there were only two in 2016 conducted between Germany and Denmark on solar PV, um, but there is reasons why we believe that um, cross-border auctions will become more relevant in the future. And this is first of all because the state aid rules that we have in place right now already um, require schemes to be, national support schemes to be open to participants in other member states in principle. Um, and um, as a result of that, a, a list of member states um, already have opening obligations in their um, national schemes. So this is a, a list of 10 member states and, and, and the ones you, you see on the bottom right map, the green ones, they basically have an obligation to partially open their schemes so far already. And now in the future the picture will, will change with the new Renewable Energy Directive which states that in, in Article 5 that um, European member states are in generally encouraged to open their national schemes. Now, while this is still voluntary, um, from the beginning it may um, be change and even become um, a binding obligation as of 2025. At the same time, um, two new uh, instruments were introduced at the EU level which um, will incentivize and facilitate cross-border cooperation. And the first of those uh, two instruments is a new funding line under the Future Connecting Europe facility. And this new funding line is specifically targeted at cross-border renewables projects. And what it will do is it will make grants available um, both for feasibility studies um, for projects, but also for the actual implementation of cross-border projects. And there's quite a significant amount of, of money available for these type of projects. And the second instrument is um, the, uh, the, what is called the EU Renewable Financing Mechanism, which is a new instrument um, whereby the European Commission itself uh, facilitates um, European-wide renewables auctions um, if European member states uh, voluntarily participate in those. And the second instrument is very interesting, especially um, from an auctions perspective. And um, I will uh, give you a little bit more detail on, on that. And then following slides. 
Um, so what we've done in the last couple of months, we, we did a case study on the um, auction in which we actually um, uh, tried to mimic um, the implementation um, of an auction under this new financing mechanism. So how is the how is it implemented, um, and what could be a potential um, effect of that? Um, now, how does it function on a very high level? So member states um, could can voluntarily contribute funds to the financing mechanism, which is handled by the European Commission. And the European Commission pools these funds and uses those to conduct auctions um, uh, in which it awards projects that are located in, in certain hosting member states that also voluntarily participate. And the resulting renewable statistics from those projects will be transferred back to the financing mechanism where they are pooled and then transferred to the contributing member states um, according to the uh, to the financial payments they made to the financing mechanism. Now, part of the renewable statistics will also remain with the hosting member states. Now, the, the main characteristics of these finance, this financing mechanism are really that the participation is, of course, voluntary for both contributing and hosting member states. Um, it focuses only on new renewable projects and, and, and thus uh, re will result in the continuous generation of statistical benefits which um, is of course a difference to the um, cooperation mechanism of statistical transfers that is currently being used by some countries. And um, the support payments that are necessary are entirely borne by the contributing member states. So the hosting member state will have some benefits such as local job creation, uh, direct investments in its uh, energy system, the modernization of the energy system, etc., without bearing any of the support costs. Um, now, in return, the contributing member state will receive the statistical rest target contributions, but not 100% of those. Uh, some of the re um, renewable statistics will remain with the hosting member state. Now, the focus of our case study was really to, to see how the, the process of setting up a tender could work out in, in practice. And um, I will just present it at a very high level scale here. So how does the process actually look like? The European Commission in the first step uh, makes a call for interest to all European member states. Um, so they should show and indicate their interest. And the second step, of course, the member states express their interest to participate in an auction under the financing mechanism. And um, by doing that, they also specify the technologies they would like to implement, the maximum volumes, they would um, demand or, or offer as a hosting member state um, and, and further criteria such as the maximum project size, geographical constraints, et cetera, et cetera. So the, especially the hosting member states are free to give a lot of specifications um, to their participation. Now, then in the third step, the European Commission would take this information from the member states and based on those draft tender documents, which uh, of course include um, the overall volume of the tenders, um, national um, maximum capacities um, that need to be uh, aligned, that need to be um, adhered to ceiling prices, etc. So the normal auction design elements that need to be um, defined. And then with this information um, goes back to the member states um, that then make uh, binding commitments. And step. Five and step six are basically then the execution of the auction, which will ultimately result in uh, project realization and the according distribution of statistical target achievement to the contributing member states. Now, this is already my last slide. Um, what we did in our case study is also to make it a bit more illustrative. We took some countries and, um, uh, and also exchanged um, and got some input and feedback from the countries that are displayed on this on this slide and uh, just to mimic and, and see how um, how this could actually uh, work in reality I must say that everything I show here is of course purely hypothetical and it's only for illustrative purposes and also don't focus so much on the numbers um, because they were not the priority in this case study we just wanted to show um, to, to illustrate how this could look like. So this is an, an onshore wind auction. We have Germany, Luxembourg and Italy as contributors, so they pay into the financing mechanism. The 
the European Commission then conducts auctions to the hosting member states, which were in this case Italy, Greece and Estonia. And the auction result is a certain amount of uh, capacity awarded to each of those hosting member states. And um, then the resulting, uh, here it is, and then the resulting um, share of statistical benefits. So 20% in this case remain with the hosting member states, the rest is then transferred to the mechanism pooled and um, transferred to the contributing member states according to their um, financial contribution. So that's it for today. Um, the case study that I um, that I uh, took a snapshot shot off here is will be um, uploaded on the RS website very soon. So if you're interested in in getting to know how the mechanism will most likely work in practice and and how illustrative outcomes could look like, um, please uh, yeah check out the website uh, in the coming days and um, yeah. Also, I'm happy to take any questions if you have further. Thank you so far. Okay, thanks a lot, Felix. Uh, so far, there are no questions. They may come later, but uh, since we are uh, running out of time, um, I will present the next uh, presenter. So to say, uh, Laszlo Sabo from REC will provide us uh, some insights on the case studies carried out in ours too. Um, okay, Laszlo is your floor is yours also. Thank you very much, Pablo, for the introductions. I'm Laszlo Sabu from REC. And actually, we were responsible for the World Package 2, which is actually covering the case studies in the, in the, in the project, which uh, is quite a nice, ni nice task. So what we have done is that we were covering something like 12 countries up till now in Europe and outside Europe, uh, having a detailed look how the auctions are going on there. And then now we have the task to have a synthesis of these case studies. So we have to find the, the main findings and the lessons learned from these uh, case study. And actually, this is what I would like to show you today in a very brief time, because I know it's, it's already 12. And I also know that, uh, sorry, I also know that uh, in Spain, it's still not lunchtime, but in other countries it might be. So I will try to be on time with my presentation. So what I would like to show you that uh, in the case when the ORS first uh, project was finalizing its case studies, it was 2016. And if you have a look at this map, you see already that which were the countries where there were auctions in place. And then you see these were the big five countries actually in Europe and uh, Denmark and, and the Netherlands was included in this uh, uh, area as well, but you also see that many other countries were planning uh, their auction. What happened uh, during these four years, and we are in 2020 now, and then uh, we are looking at the countries, so can you see a green continent now? So what you observe here, maybe two or three European countries doesn't have and doesn't plan actually at the auctions, but the rest is there and we are using them and they are just uh, learning from each other and then doing their own auctions in the in the region, which is quite nice. So we have a quite lot of countries where you can, we can choose the, the, the case study. So actually what we have done, we were selecting these case studies based on expert judgment that we, which are the countries where the most interesting outcomes come or where are the big changes which are coming into the pictures. But of course we should have uh, developed maybe a bit more uh, case studies of course, resources are always determinant here, so we had to stick to this 12 number of countries within Europe and outside. And actually, what I will present now is that what are the main trends or developments which we can see in these 12 case studies, mainly focusing in the European case. And then it's an interesting insight. And what we hope for is that in the course of November, we have this synthesis report finalized and it will be put on the website of our ESH and you can also have a look at uh, these uh, uh, conclusions and, uh, and uh, the paper itself. So what we, we come out and what we have learned from the case studies is of course what I have showed you is that there are more countries participating in this auction world in, in Europe. So we see the green map of Europe and what we see and observe is that there, there is this learning effect regionalization, which means that countries learn from each other. 
uh, most countries who come up with new auctions, they have a look at what happens in the other countries and they take bits and pieces from, from the design and they, they make their own development in this field. I hope that the ORES team itself help these countries as well in this learning effect as well. Uh, what we observe is that this part of Europe, the Central Eastern European parts of the Eastern, the newcomer block, was not in green before, but what you already observed that most countries here as well, they are already participating in, in the renewable auctions. Slovenia, Poland, and Hungary already had more rounds here. Croatia is act actually undergoing the first one. And Slovakia had one, but which was postponed due to the COVID. Uh, what we can observe as a general trend, and you are always asking about the prices, is that uh, it's an ambiguous trend. Actually, what we have observed is at the beginning, there was a price reduction trend in the auction result, but later on, this trend was rather stopped, and we, we see some uh, movements here. Sometimes it's upward, but actually, the most important question here is not the prices, because what you have to be certain and sure that auctions will follow the several trends and they have to follow the LCO developments of the technologies and they have to follow the market development as well. So it's not that uh, the auction themselves will bring down the prices. The most important question is whether the auctions are uh, good enough uh, to follow the, uh, the cost reduction of these technologies. And my hypothesis would be based on the case studies that they were quite good at it. If you have a look at the, the, the case studies and you see the newcomers like Hungary and, and uh, Poland, for example, we have observed that already at the very first phase of the uh, auctions, we saw a very significant reduction from the original feed-in tariff administrative reset premium scheme to the auction because there was competition. And then developers were willing to give away some of their uh, additional support, which was there before. So we didn't one or two years time, we see already this price reduction in the country, which is quite an important message there. The big question for our region, I mean, the Eastern European region, whether we can we will be able to observe a similar price reduction trend as in other countries, because what you can learn is whether the first auctions are usually rather at a higher price, and then we see a reducing trend later on when additional auctions will come. But of course, the message here is that market, and the, the technology development will be the main driver here, not the auction design itself. Just to show you this graph is that, uh, what, just to illustrate what I mentioned, you see the trend of Belmont prices and then some uh, equaling or even increasing prices later on in the PV technologies in, in other countries. And then just three slides on what are the main takeaways or lessons we, we we collected from the case studies, and we see at the, at the design elements, we see this learning as well. So, for example, in the renumeration scheme, we see that most countries go for this floating premium, but of course, there are two or three different variants of this, and it's really dependent on the country. So, whether one sided or two sided, it's really uh, country specific. And we see in additional or other design elements quite wide range of options. And this is what you can observe in the case studies as well. That, for example, if you take the equalification criteria, what you see there is that every country always uses a different approach in this. And it's mainly based on their energy market structure and based on the regulation type, which was it using before. But of course, here we see as well some learning effect as well, maybe not that visible, not as visible as in other parts of the design. Uh, two very important messages from the case studies and for, from other countries' experience is that the very significant one is that we have a problem and issues with the realization rate. And the issue here is that we do not have the information. We do not have the reliable information on that, in spite of the fact that now we have many years of auctions taking place in Europe. We only have five countries where we found reliable data on their realization. It's very, very bad message for us, for researchers, but for the governments as well, because for us, it's difficult to analyze the effectiveness and efficiency of options. But it's the same bad message for governments as well, because they don't know if their auction design or auction elements are going into the right direction. So this is an area where I would expect a lot of development in the future that governments and the institutions will have to take care really the monitoring of the realization of these uh, auctions as well. 
The second very important issue here is that uh, we see some experiments or trials that countries now try the multi-technology option. So earlier in the first place, probably it was like that most countries went for one technology specific option, either for PV or VIN, or for both of them, but separately. And now we see these new experiments from countries like Germany and Denmark, that they, they put together technologies where you can put them together, and then they would like to have a look at what are the results of it. And some of the newcomer countries like Poland and Hungary, they have to do it because of the EU regulation as well. So regulation here has an important factor, uh, which is important. And just my last slide here, what do we see as the new developments or new approaches uh, among the various countries which we have assessed, is that uh, we see this that uh, uh, when you have this change of design, I mean, you move away from the traditional mm -hmm. support scheme to an auction time. Uh, we see a very interesting development that there is these two type of interaction. There is the first one is that the rush for the old system. So if you have the time for that, you still want to go for the feed-in tariff system because it seems to be more higher priced, more reliable, more known for you. Yeah, and the other impact is that once you go for the for the renewable auctions and you get uh, the taste of it, it might help you as well that if you had this two, three years type of waiting time, in the first auctions, you might have a lot of participation and higher competition rate. The big question here whether this higher competition rate will, will follow later on, whether you keep you can keep this high interest later on, which is, I think, a big uh, question mark. And then you can also observe in the in the case studies as well, and then probably if you just read the, the news about the countries, that there are new trends and uh, new approaches in, in several countries. The two most important probably comes from the Netherlands and Germany, because in the Neder Netherlands, they are planning for a new type of auctions, but not the actually the energy volume or capacity will be auctioned, but they rather go for the for the carbon impact. Which is quite an interesting and new, trend, new, new, new direction. But we are just rather curious that who it will be actually realized. That's a big, big question. And the other example is Germany, where this innovation or innovative auction already took place with some new design elements or new directions, which is quite interesting. Using fixed premium and bundle technologies, I think it's a very, very interesting direction for the future. We are really looking for learning from these. Uh, the trends as well. So this this was all what I wanted to say and thank you very much for your attention and if you have any question please do so and we will try to answer it now or later on. Thanks a lot. Okay well thanks uh, a lot uh, Laszlo for this uh, very insightful presentation of, uh, of the case studies we, we have performed in, in ours too. I think uh, the, the trends are really interesting uh, and provide information, relevant information. Um, okay, uh, now we have also a very interesting topic, which is the trends uh, and evolution of the cost of capital and renewable energy financing. Um, so, Agustin Roth from Eclareon, uh, you can start. Thanks. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you, everyone, for joining the workshop. So I'm Agustin, I'm working in Eclarion, and I will present today the trends and evolution of the cost of capital in renewable energy financing, which are the results of um, our research um, in the Aures project. Um, so I'm trying to go to the next slide. Uh, okay, yeah, now it's working. So um, the agenda for today, uh, I will present a little bit what, what is the weighted average cost of capital so we can be all on the same page. Then the main results of our research of 2019 and the overtime development and some conclusions. Um, <clears throat> the main highlights of our results that we're going to discuss today are that we observed a strong decrease of the cost of capital, the cost of debt and the cost of equity across Europe which is, was very impressive, as you will see. Um, the main drivers behind these changes um, could be a reduction in the country risks, the appearance of new business cases, um, also the monetary policy of the European Central Bank and the evolution of the interest rates, and certain spillover effects with international money, as, we, as we'll, I will show you later. And as we know, a lower cost of capital are a positive sign 
for the further renewable energy development and to reach energy and climate goals in the European Union. How uh, we arrived to our results? So there are many, uh, mainly three points. First of all, we already had data from 2014 and 16 from previous projects, the Diacore project and the Reframe projects that many of you may know already. And this, in second place, we also collected new data between December of last year and April of this year. We conducted 100 interviews with um, different stakeholders as project developers, bankers, and so on. And we asked them about the, the cost of capital, debt, equity, and other financial variables. And last, uh, we validated our results with experts. But first, we move after uh, before we move to the results. Uh, some caveats that we should uh, should bear in mind. First of all, you know that the market conditions for renewable energy can change very quickly, especially in COVID times. Um, the transparency when talking about these topics with interviewees sometimes can be an issue. And last point is that. Um, certain European countries lack of a significant uh, development of wind power in the last years. Um, so as I said, today we are going to talk a lot about the weighted average cost of capital. I know that many of you are experts and know already what it is, but just let me give a very quick example so we can be all on the same page. Let's imagine I want to invest in a wind farm. I will need to raise capital. Actually, I will need to raise a lot of capital. and for this, I have two main options or two main ways to raise money. First of all, I can go to a bank and ask for a loan and then I need to pay the, the interest rate, right? And this is what we could call easily the cost of debt. But there's also a second option, which is to invest my own money, so my, my, my equity. And in this case, the cost is not just my money, but it's also the opportunity cost because I could have invested my money in a different project, maybe more profitable. So if we weight and we average this uh, cost of debt and equity, we will obtain the weighted average cost of capital or shortly cost of capital. But why should we care about this variable? Why is that it's so important? So mainly there are two reasons that we could mention. As you can see in this graph, that is a model, um, you can see that uh, the cost of producing electricity or the LEC or LCOE uh, depends partly in the WAC. So at higher WAC uh, values, uh, wind, coal, and gas cost uh, or production cost increase, as you can see in, in this graph. But if you notice, uh, wind power is the most sensitive technology. So it reacts uh, more heavily when, when, when we have a, a higher WAC. And the second point that why should we care about this variable is that up to a certain WAC value, um, wind power will be the cheapest and most cost-effective technology compared to, to other carbon-intense technologies. In this model that we are seeing, uh, this value or this threshold will be 8%. So uh, up to 8%, we could say that according to this model, wind power uh, would be the most cheap uh, or, or the most cost-effective technology. So this is why the WAC is important and why a low WAC is also important. But let's jump in directly into the result of our research. So I will be presenting the results for wind onshore. Um, don't feel overwhelmed at so many numbers. Uh, the report will um, be published short, shortly and you will be able to explore it deeply and to read everything. So just uh, now let me guide you through the results. Um, as you can see here in the map, this is the work for 2019. And we can mention that there is uh, still a gap between countries with a low WAC, for example, Germany, Denmark, and France, as you can see in green, compared to other countries that have a, a very high WAC, for example, the Baltic region or some countries in Southeast uh, Europe, like Romania or Greece. But also something that was really interesting is that, for example, in Spain, you can see a huge spread between the minimum value and the maximum value of the WAC. So if we zoom in into Spain, you can see um, 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 we, we plot the, the, the overtime development from 2014 to 2019, and you can see that the spread uh, between the minimum and maximum value of WAC was already there in 2014, and now it's bigger. Um, 
according to our interviewees, uh, we learned that this could be because we have different market players uh, investing in renewable ener energy, and they uh, have different interests. They participate in different business models, and hence they um, they um, face different costs and returns and capital structures, which could lead or could explain partly this spread that we observe in Spain, but also in Sweden and so on. But let's see what happened with the WAC over time across Europe. So here um, in this low graph, we could, uh, we could see how, um, how dramatic this trend was and almost all the countries decreased the cost of capital um, in this time that we consider in the research. There are many or multiple reasons to explain this trend. So some of them could be explained by reduced country uh, or regulatory risks, for example, or more competition. But to fully understand what's behind, we should uh, focus on the cost of debt and the cost of equity, because these are the components of the, of the WAC. So let's go first to the cost of debt. I cannot, okay, now, yes, sorry. So um, the cost of that here for 2019, again, for wind onshore, what we can see is a nice uh, green path that starts in Portugal and goes up to Finland. And all this green pathway, it's composed by countries that have a cost of debt lower than 2%, which is very impressive. It's a very low cost of debt. And let's see what happened over time. So over time, we also observed that absolutely all the countries in the European Union reduced the cost of debt in the period considered, which is very, very uh, remarkable. Um, now I would present two main reasons that we consider could be behind this cost of debt decrease. First of all, is not that surprising, but still it's remarkable that there is a, a strong correlation between the cost of debt and the interest rates uh, in the Eurozone countries. For example, here we plotted Spain and Greece, and you can see um, in blue, the blue line, it's the, the, the interest rate of that country. In both cases, it decreased but also the cost of debt in yellow, you can see that it also decreased and it decreased at a faster rate. So now in 2019, the, the gap is narrowing. So this, is, this could also be a, an explanation, uh, but we also uh, learned from, our, uh, from, the, from the interviews that there is a lot of international money going around and, or moving through Europe and coming from other continents. And this could generate spillover effects. For example, if, if, we, uh, if we focus on Sweden, we can see that money is coming from North America, but also from Asia and also from Germany. And if we look at Germany, it's impressive how many arrows are starting in Germany. And this means that money is, is moving from Germany to, for example, Italy, and from Italy is moving to Spain and from Spain to Portugal. So this could be creating spillovers of uh, cheaper debt or cheaper capital. Now uh, let's move to the second component of the WAC, the cost of equity. Here again, the result for 2019. Um, well, here what we observed that was also interesting is that already 60% uh, of, of all the countries have a cost of equity that is lower than 10 points. And we also learned that uh, in riskier countries, it could be um, that, is, um, that the cost of equity is higher as well. Um, let's see the overtime development of this uh, cost of equity. Here again, it's impressive. Almost all the countries reduce the cost of equity. And there are again multiple reasons, but the reason that we would like to share with you today, because for, for us it was really, really interesting, is that uh, there are new market players. Uh, let's say, for example, the chemistry industry or the car industry or big players as Facebook, Amazon, Ikea, and so on, that they are very interested in green in their portfolio. So that to, to have a green portfolio, and they are more uh, maybe interested in having this green portfolio rather than making profit with a specific renewable energy project. Um, so we're not saying that this could explain 
all the reduction of the cost of equity. We are just saying that there are new market players entering into the, re into the renewable energy uh, world or, or sector, and they have different interests, right? Uh, and this could be um, a, a game changer, so to say. Uh, but more reason and more explanation you, you will find in the report that is upcoming next. Uh, so, uh, one of the last slides for today is the uh, variable uh, that we could call debt to equity ratio that um, shows or explain the capital structure as, or of a specific project. Uh, what we what you could observe here is a strong gap between dark uh, red countries and dark green countries. As you can see, it's very impressive the gap and. Well, what we could see is that uh, in countries like in Germany or France, uh, the capacity to leverage uh, or raise debt is very high. And this could also be related to uh, the lower WAC or the lower cost of capital that, that these countries show. So uh, last, some conclusions to remark again. So as, 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 we, as we observe together, there's a dramatic decrease of the WAC, the cost of debt and cost of equity. Behind the cost of debt, uh, we should remark the role of interest rates and international capital spillovers. Behind the cost of equity, as I said, there's emergence of new investors with different interest and business models. And last, uh, la lower cost of capital are a positive sign for a further renewable energy development. So thanks uh, for your time and attention, and I'm happy to answer questions, if any, or you could also contact me by email and we could discuss. Further. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Agustin, for a nice, concise, and very clear presentation. Um, I was wondering what uh, COVID will, uh, how COVID will affect this. But this will for another day or future research, probably. You have a, a question, a very quick question from Ivan. Uh, Ivan uh, asks: Is the uh, uh, debt equity a split for onshore wind and PV? Uh, yes, uh, so uh, what I showed in the presentation is uh, for wind onshore, uh, but in the report that is coming up, uh, we also uh, present results for wind offshore and for PV separately. But what we discussed today is just uh, wind onshore. Okay. Okay, thanks. Well, uh, now is the last presentation by uh, our project coordinator. Uh, Basilius, um, who will comment on multi-technology auctions and technological BS, probably pro providing future insights and what, what will be done. Yes, thanks. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Pablo. Um, so luckily, looking at the time, it's a rather preview um, than a content-related um, presentation. So um, basically, uh, we are going to have uh, um, two reports on one topic, which is um, on multi-technology auctions. So why are we doing it? We are seeing more and more multi-technology auctions in Europe, as Laszlo already said. So we are still figuring out if it's by um, because the European Commission demands it rather than especially the stated guidelines, as we already saw with the um, discussion in the question. Or um, do um, countries themselves want to move um, further away from technology-specific auctions and try to harness um, the advantages of uh, multi-technology auctions? So nevertheless, what the reason is, um, uh, we considered an important future trend in the landscape of um, res auctions. Never, um, nevertheless, there are several challenges. So um, first of all, which technology should be included, of course? How do multi-technology auctions perform? Are they better or are they not that good as um, technology specific auctions um, can can we even or should we offer a level playing field especially in looking at realization periods penalties i guess you had these kind of um, discussions in spain as well to see okay how are we um, especially in spain um, um, as we saw with uh, the two auctions in 2017, and just a very general question, so how, how are they designed? What uh, do policymakers look into? So we have one report that looks theoretically, especially on these topics, um, on this technology bias, where we say, okay, do we have a longer um, realization period? This helps, for example, um, um, uh, certainly um, it's good for um, onshore wind and um, if we have a shorter one it's um, of course better um, for PV because PV can better adapt and so um, and so um, so forth 
Um, the report I'm focusing on is a report, an overall report on multi technology auctions. It is going to be um, published um, by the end of November. So um, the first uh, contribution we want to make with this report is to find an, to establish an exact terminology because, as you can see, um, there are a lot of um, words describing this kind of auctions. For example, technology neutral, uh, multi technology, technology basket, and we want to establish to say, okay, um, how should we call it? And especially looking into that by um, in terms of technology openness. So which technologies can participate? PV, wind, biomass, and um, are they allowed, um, are hybrids allowed or um, um, plants, power plants together um, with storage? So th this is going to be a very nice analysis in there. Furthermore, we want to provide an overview of the design elements chosen um, in the multi technology auctions. Um, we want to present the auction outcomes and provide a first broad analysis um, to see, okay, did the countries really use only multi-technology auctions or did they have anything in parallel? How did they design it? So a nice overview. And uh, in addition, we want to provide two to three um, brief case studies in this report. So we're still um, um, discussing which ones to use. So um, there are examples also of the, outside of the EU. So the P, uh, P, uh, PJM or Brooklyn Queens Demand Management Program where um, um, renewables and demand set management measures are in one auction, um, or um, for example, the SD++ in the Netherlands, where um, CO2 savings are the main um, the main mechanism. So you can um, this is the main mechanism, the main product to bid on. Um, in India, we have some hybrid auctions um, in the sense of their um, hybrid projects that are procured. And um, the same in Denmark, we have technology multi technology auctions um, which includes hybrids. Um, and Germany is moving uh, to this as well. So um, moving away from this, uh, let's say the traditional multi-technology auctions, PV versus wind, but to have storage included, to have um, hybrid projects. Um, um, and so the, these will be the, the topics that we are going to look into. So that's it from my side. So a nice um, um, small preview and luckily I'm the last one. So um, thank you very much to all the presenters, to all the participants. Um, to all the people who per, uh, participate in this uh, workshop. I don't know if we have any more questions. Um, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, um, looking at the time. So if you have any questions, any remarks, please feel free to contact me or Pablo um, or the presenters. Um, thanks again, Pablo, for hosting everything. And yeah, thank you very much from my side. Pablo? Yeah, thanks a lot to all of you. Uh, it's time to wrap up. Uh, just a, a few words on that. Uh, well, we have had to clear the differentiated parts in this uh, today. The first one was more focused on the impact of uh, auctions on renewable energy uh, with uh, government and also uh, perspectives from the companies, uh, particularly in Spain. And then the second one was more with the work, uh, dealt with the work of uh, partners in the Hours 2 project. Uh, I think we, we get quite a lot of insight from both parts of it. Um, I apologize for, you know, the delay. Uh, we had uh, two hours and three, 30 minutes. Uh, still 33 people are out there. Thanks to all of you for attending, also for the presenters. Uh, I enjoyed a lot of all the presentations, so it was really great. And thanks a lot for, to you. And just to tell you that there is a lot of information on the Hours 2 project website uh, that we are, that you can visit anytime. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a good place to go. Okay, thanks a lot. Next time it will be uh, not, not an online one. Uh, we wanted to have tapas, uh, but not this time, next time probably. And well, see you all and thanks a lot for being there. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.